many times, and uh, he, but never on an occasion where he would invite somebody up to play. Um, and uh, and and on this occasion, he did, and like nobody was was going up to take the offer. It was during a song called "Take Me, I'm Yours," which is one of their more famous ones. And uh, also, I, I know dozens of Squeeze songs by heart, and that is one that I did not know the chord progression to. But nobody was going, and he like actually was gonna just move on and 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 you know like do his solo or whatever. He just wanted somebody to play rhythm while he soloed. So um, nobody was going, and this was sort of the impetus for the way that I've lived my life for probably about, I guess, the last 10 years or so, which is that uh, I'm just going to ignore the voice in the back of my head that tells me I can't do something or shouldn't do something or, you know, give in to the, the fear and... and, uh, and what you might call it, fright, whatever. That fear and fright are kind of the same thing. But so I just ran up there. I just stopped thinking, and I went up there, and um, and he asked me if I wanted to play the acoustic he had sitting there, or his like awesome black Telecaster. <laughs> and so I pointed at the Telecaster, and uh, so I started playing that, and then I let him know that I didn't know the chords. <laughs> And he just, he's like, oh, okay, that's all right. And then he just like shouted him out and I played and he even let me solo just a little bit. And um, it was awesome. I actually came down off of the stage and had people tell me that I played better than the opener. So <laughs> that's my once in a lifetime story. Thank you. Guys, keep it going for Jared. That is a super rad story. And I feel like not all bands are that cool. So when things like that happen, it's awesome. Super amazing. All right, guys. Uh, Our next storyteller is a regular, but she hasn't been here in a while. And she's busy. And you might not recognize her because her hair's not pink anymore. Put your hands together for Marina. Hey. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to take this off the stand because I'm too short. Um... So, once in a lifetime. So, uh, I was trying to think of something to, to come up with tonight. I was talking to my, with my boyfriend over the phone because he's kind of having his own once in a lifetime experience right now. He just left on tour yesterday with his band. Uh, it's their first tour. It's down the East Coast. I'm like super excited for him. And I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Um, but I, he was, he just asked me tonight when I was talking about once in a lifetime, he's like, what was it that made you want to do acting? Like what show was it that got you into it? And I had to stop and think about that. Cause I was like, what? Like, I don't know. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I, I do uh, like a bit of community theater. I started um, doing it in high school. I mostly do plays and Shakespeare. I'm not really a big musical person cause I can't dance and I can only kind of sing. Um, but my first play was, uh, I, don't remember, I don't remember what it was called. It was in like sixth or seventh grade. And I was playing like, like an orphan and just, you know, some, some stupid little thing like that. And, uh, but I just remember like really enjoying the experience of like rehearsing with other people and like getting to build this story together. And so I kept doing it all through high school, despite the fact that like my high school theater, theater teacher like hated me. Um, which was fair, like if you knew high school me. Um, but it wasn't until about two years after I graduated high school, cause I stopped doing theater after I graduated. And then I, I started again, um, doing a production of Macbeth. Um, and there's this whole thing with, uh, Macbeth where you're, yeah. So someone's freaking out. Yeah. You're not supposed to say it in a theater, but this is not a theater. This is, we're storytelling. It's different. Okay. It's a Scottish play. Okay. Or Mackers or whatever you want to call it. Um, I try to respect people's adherence to that rule. I don't really believe in the curse, but I'm not going to tempt fate other than what I just did. Um, But yeah, so I was, I was doing the Scottish play and the particular company that I was with, it was called Grassroot Shakespeare and they're not around anymore because the board kind of dissolved after everyone went their separate ways, like to grad school or moved to a different state or something like that. And uh, it was, it was my first time acting in two years and 
uh, the casting process was a little different than like your standing your standard casting process where you go up in front of a director and do a monologue and then you go to callbacks and they're like cool we want to offer you this role um with grassroots it was you all got together like whoever was auditioning like all came at the same time you all auditioned in front of each other um you got feedback on your monologue and then you did it again taking that feedback into account and then everyone would like vote for who they wanted to be in the cast like not necessarily the roles yet and then those people would vote on the roles that they wanted other people to play um so it was like a very collaborative sort of process and uh they voted me to play lady m the uh, female lead and i was like what I haven't acted in two years. This is really exciting. Um, And I was not prepared to play a role of that caliber, like, at all. But I still had a ton of fun with it, and especially because opening night. So the whole thing with the Scottish play is that there's a curse surrounding it that either the witches that Shakespeare wrote about actually cursed the play for, like, stealing their story or whatever it was. And um, uh, opening night of the show was in October of, like, 2015, and... It it was looking kind of cloudy all day, and we're like, oh, it's probably going to be fine. It was Shakespeare in the Park. Like, we built the stage ourselves out in this park in Mesa, and uh, it started raining about halfway, uh, about two, mm, two acts into the production. Um, if you're not familiar with Shakespeare, they're typically, like, five-act productions, and we had shortened ours to about, like, an hour runtime. Um, but it started raining on us, and it was outside. There was, like, no cover uh, it was really cool because when it started raining, it was like right after this murder scene. So my friend Ethan, who is playing Mackers, is like standing on the stage and he's like delivering this great monologue. And he's got like the fake blood on his hands and it just starts like running down his arm and it looks really creepy. And then and then one of the company members is like, hey, we're going to stop the production because it's raining. But everyone in the audience was like, we still want to see it. So there was this little Ramada nearby. And so we just moved there. Everybody stayed and we got to perform it there and and lady m has like this monologue where she's like losing her mind and so like instead of doing that up on a stage i got to like get all up in people's faces and like be crazy and it was it was really fun and um i when i was talking about about when i was talking about that to thomas my, my boyfriend tonight i realized that like i've had a moment like that in almost every show that i've done in the past you know three and a half years now and well, I know that I want to go on to work in film and I'm kind of more interested in that as like a medium uh, in terms of acting. I also really value like the theater experiences that I have because every show is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like the show that you were performing with the group of people that you were performing it with will never be perso- performed the same way, you know, even night to night and it will, it will never happen again. And it's always going to be a once in a lifetime opp- opportunity. And I really... I really love that. So while I don't necessarily want to do theater forever, I love every moment that I get to have within it and every moment that I get to act and experience with other people and the stories that we get to build and create and the ways that we get to affect other people. And so Thomas was saying, you know, even if you haven't found like that, that one production that really stands out, like you keep giving yourself these opportunities to have once in a lifetime opportunities. And I think that doesn't apply to theater. That doesn't just apply to theater. Like you can find once in a lifetime opportunities in like almost every facet of your life just by changing the way that you look at things. Cause you know, someone may not think that like a dodgeball competition is that exciting, but to other people it's like, no, this was the coolest thing. And it is just cause of the way that you decide to look at it. So yeah, that's my story. One more time for Marina, please. Uh, I love the point that you brought up with the once in a lifetime with each and every show that you do. Because just like here, even though we host this week after week, the show is always different every week. Different stories, different storytellers, different perspectives. And sometimes, you know, things either go perfectly or they, they just don't. And we've had a couple, we've definitely had a couple of shows where it's like, yikes, why do we do this? But, um,. <laughs> No, um, that's never been in question, but we do this for you guys and we do this for, you know, to see this community grow and it's a wonderful experience and glad we get to share this with you. Um, speaking of reasons why we do this, uh, we do this for the new storytellers and the new perspectives, introducing a new storyteller to Chatterbox. Please help me welcome Deborah. (laughs) 
My mother and grandmother were pregnant at the same time. A week after I was born, my grandmother gave birth to a boy, my uncle, little Stephen. We grew up together like brother and sister. As we got older, he wanted me to call him Uncle Stephen. I'm not calling you uncle. You're a kid like me. When we both turned nine, he ordered me to call him Uncle Stephen. It's a sign of respect. Call me uncle. He thought he could tell me what to do. I told you, a real uncle is a man who is big, a grown-up who looks like an uncle. You're going to call me Uncle Steve or I'm going to beat you up. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm bigger than you. I pounded him into the ground and got him to cry uncle. (laughs) Grandma Olive, Stephen's mom, has many fruit trees in her yard. Coconut, naysberry, Aki, the national fruit of Jamaica, and that big old mango tree right smack in the middle. One summer, when I was queen of the tree climbers, Stephen's, Stephen's outside my window yelling for me to come outside and play. Psst, Debbie, look. I'm doing homework, dummy. Some people do, you know. Look, Debbie, look. He runs inside and starts waving a dollar bill in front of my face. You want this dollar? I'll give it to you if you climb up the mango tree with me. He's going to pay me a dollar to climb a tree? That's like paying a fish to swim. A dollar can buy me and my friends candy for a whole week. I looked at my homework and suddenly realized spelling don't pay. I run outside and climb up the mango tree like a lizard. If they had climbing mango tree in the Olympics... I could have brought home the goal for Jamaica. <laughs> so, here I am pretty close to the top of the mango tree when slowpoke little Stephen, who believe me I'm not calling uncle, finally gets up here. He just started being bigger than me. Okay, give me the dollar. Wait, first I want you to do what I say. I'm not calling you uncle. I don't care what you call me. I have something I want to show you. He unzips his pants. I'll give you the dollar. But first, I'll show you mine, and then you show me yours. Fair deal? It's a sin. Pastor White says it's a sin. We'll burn in hell. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. I ain't showing you nothing. Give me the dollar and I'll take a look at yours. I never saw anybody hand over money so fast. He was so excited. I'm going to get to see it. I always wondered what it looked like. I know, I know, God, I shouldn't be doing this, but maybe it's only half a sin if I just take a quick look and don't touch anything. I inch closer. He pulls out what looks like a snake with one eye. You know, when you grow up, there's so many exciting things in the world. Some are simple things. You see a cake rise. How did it do that? Amazing. When you first see a giraffe, wow, look at that neck. It changed my whole idea about what a neck could be. Surprises on top of surprises. And now, at this tender age, I learned that my nine-year-old uncle has a snake between his legs. You know, when Alice goes through the looking glass into Wonderland, that's where I was. For me, my Uncle Stephen had a mad hatter in his pants. (laughs) Touch it. Did you hear that? He wants me to touch it. I felt like I was falling down the rabbit.